This is the Value Investor Podcast with Tracy Reinick. All things value, all the time. Welcome back, value investors. So maybe you've heard the recent news stories by ProPublica about the millionaires and billionaires using Roth IRAs to build up millions and even billions of dollars in those Roth IRA accounts, which, as you know, are untaxable assets when you go to take the assets out. So this was kind of the big story that this uh, some of these accounts were leaked to ProPublica. Uh, for example, PayPal founder Peter Thiel, that was one of the ones that was leaked. He was able to amass $5 billion in his Roth IRA from 1999. And how he did it was he deposited the options, his founder shares, in the account in 1999. Um, he had 1.7 million of those shares. PayPal was still private at the time and they were worth just 0.001 cent, 0.001 cent per share. That's how he was able to get in with the contribution limits into the IRA. Um, and then when it went, uh, you know, acquired by eBay, went public later, all those shares generated over the years, those shares are at new highs here. And now it's worth like $5 billion, I think, as of the end of 2018. But I'm not that interested in Mr. Teal's investing because you and I aren't company founders. The last I checked, I did not get 1.7 million shares of some company that I was able to put into one of these accounts, and I'm not going to get that. So I don't really care what the founders are doing with the founder shares other than, you know, tax implications or societal implications of using a Roth IRA in this manner. But that's for, you know, politicians to figure out, not us. But I'm more interested in some of the other stories that did emerge from ProPublica, including Ted Weschler's Roth IRA. Now, you may be somewhat familiar with Ted Weschler, or you've heard the name before, because he's one of Warren Buffett's two lieutenants. So he works at Berkshire Hathaway now. And over 29 years, it came out in this reporting by ProPublica, he was able to amass $264.4 million in his Roth IRA. So when this story came out just about a week ago, uh, he actually released a statement talking about how he was able to use the IRA to amass that amount of money. Um, and really, it has not much to do with it being in a Roth or um, a regular IRA, actually. Uh, So that's the interesting part. A lot of emphasis in the media is being placed on the fact that this is in a Roth, which means it will not be taxed when he decides to take it out. (laughs) So um, that's getting all the publicity. But to me, the bigger story is that someone was able to amass this level of wealth in an IRA at all. And I think that's where you and I can benefit from taking a closer look at how he did it. And basically, could we do it too? If he did it, why not us? So I pulled out a couple of lessons that I think we can learn from what he did starting uh, way back in the day and how he was able to do it. And so this kind of lays out um, some key themes that I've talked about many times on various of my podcasts. So you won't be surprised to hear it again. So the first lesson is to start young. I've talked about this in the past, but it becomes pretty obvious when you see Ted's story. So he had just started his first job. It was at WR Grace and um, he had to wait a year in order to qualify for their company IRA. And that was, he put in some of his money and then the company would match it, kind of like the 401k today. But back then it was just called the IRA through the company, through WR Grace. So he was 22 when he finished up his first year and he was able to put money in. That was in 1984. He said he was making $22,000 a year and he put in the maximum, which 
um, looking back, the maximum would have been two thousand dollars back then. And but he did get a partial company match, he said, but he didn't say how much of the match. But either way, he put in two thousand dollars in nineteen eighty four. So this was just in the regular again company IRA, like you and I have through like a 401k, or if you don't have a company 401k, um, you could just open up a regular IRA account through E-Trade, Schwab, any of them, they all have it, and he just put in the maximum that year. Then he continued to put them in, so this was not a Roth IRA, by the way, Um, Roth IRAs didn't get created until 1998, so this was just a regular IRA account. He continued to put it in his whole tenure at WR Grace, and he left in 1989, so five years later. Now, it had, according to Ted, $70,385 in it when he left WR Grace. Now, that's pretty tremendous because if you're only putting in, let's just say, $2,000 a year over five years, that's just $10,000. He was able to parlay 10,000 into 70,000. But remember the 1980s, the start of one of the longest bull markets in stock market history, started in about 1981. And even with the 87 crash, it was still uh, booming all of those years. So obviously he was in, uh, investing in you know fairly aggressive stocks stock funds, probably mutual funds back in the day, and he was able to grow it to $70,385 when he left. So he left to start his own firm. So he tells us that he rolled it over in 1989 when he left into a Schwab IRA. And that's another key lesson. Number two kind of joint key lessons is always roll over your 401ks at your job. If you leave to take a new job, um, many people cash it in because it's kind of just sitting there. You do have the option of cashing it in, even if you're not of the retirement age yet, and you can take the penalty on it. You can cash it in and, you know, go on that vacation or something. Um, But the better method is to roll it over into your own IRA that, again, you can open at most of the brokerages, almost all of them have it now. So you can roll it over right into there and then keep um, earning on whatever you have in there. So he rolled it into Schwab IRA in 1989. The bull market was still uh, charging along. He says he only bought publicly traded stocks that were available to the general public. So he he didn't do anything fancy. Um, It sounds like he didn't buy bonds. He only bought uh, stocks in in this uh, self-directed fund, so he didn't have to buy mutual funds anymore because he had access to regular stocks through Schwab now. So he just bought regular stocks. He doesn't say if he kept funding it during this time, um, so we don't know if he put any more principal in. But since he didn't say, I'm kind of thinking maybe he did not. So 1989 to 2000, the bull market raged. The S&P 500 was compounding at anywhere between um, annualized 18 to 20% during that time. So the 70,000 he started with and then adding stocks, uh, you know, putting it into the stocks during that time really would have been compounding it over that 10 year time period. So the, the second lesson is Roll over your your uh, work account into another IRA. Don't cash it in and also buy stocks. The third lesson is simply to stay invested. So he held stocks through the bus uh, from what we know. We don't know what he was in, but given the compounding in this account, he um, had to pretty much stay in something during this time period. So he held stocks through 2000, 2003 downturn and the Great Recession, huge downturn in the market, 2008, 2009. So in 2012, he decided to convert it to the Roth IRA because the government at that time gave a two year window for people in traditional IRAs to convert it over. 
the value of the IRA at that time, he says, was $131 million by 2012. He paid $29.2 million in taxes because when you convert from the traditional into the Roth, you have to pay the taxes on it. So he paid $29.2 million and that's how he got it into a Roth account. But he had stayed invested clearly through all of those downturns, through the bear market of the, that era, and um, you know was able to grow that seventy thousand from nineteen eighty nine into yes one hundred and thirty one million dollars by owning publicly traded stocks. Okay, so then by the power of compounding, ProPublica's data ends at the end of 2018. So it's through the year 2018. And at that time, it was worth $264 million. So from 2012 through 2018, he grew it from 131 to 264. And clearly, since 2018, stocks have gone up again. It's, it's going to be higher than 264 here in 2021. He did not say, he's not revealing how high it is really gone now. But lesson number four is what I've talked about many times, the power of compounding. As many of you know who are longer term investors, once you get even to that first $1,000, um, it feels like pretty good to get to $1,000 in your account. But then it feels really good to get to your first $10,000. So once you get to that level, you're like, okay, I'm doing pretty good. And then the next key level is $100,000. And it may seem like you may never get there, especially if you're just putting in a couple thousand dollars a year into one of these accounts. But again, the power of compounding does work, especially in a bull market like we've seen since 2013 in the US stock market. So the compounding has been working and you hopefully will be lucky enough to get to that 100,000. And that's when you really start seeing the power of the compounding um, happen much more quickly and more obviously when you go to look at your account. So even if that whole thing was in just the S&P 500 and say you're at 100,000 starting this year and it's in an S&P 500 fund ETF, with the S&P 500 up, you know, 14, 15, 16%, well, suddenly your 100,000 is at 116,000. And that's when you can see the power of the compounding. So Ted said in his statement, and I'm quoting, the investing success of this account has been a function of careful stock selection, exceptional luck, and a multi-decade time period, unquote. That is basically his secret. Yes, he did get lucky. We don't know what he bought. I would love to know. Don't you want to know? I would. Um, but we just know it's stocks. We can kind of guess maybe a couple things he might have had in there given the outperformance of, say, FANG stocks over that time period. So we can maybe guess at least one of them would have been a FANG stock. But um, it really comes down to... 1984 through 2018, and really since he was self-investing uh, it, since 1989, that was 29 years of investing. Um, so this isn't even those people we always talk about where we hear it's like 50 years or even Warren Buffett himself, 75 years. This is 29 years. He does go on to say that his account was implemented in a way available to all taxpayers, and he said the dollar he saved as a 22 year old in New York City in that first job grew over those 35 years because um, the first IRA was when he was 22. And that grew, that $1 grew into $9,000 within 35 years. And he said he hopes that his story can motivate future savers. Well, I don't know about you, but even just reading a statement felt like motivation and we don't even know what's in it but 
he was just kind of normal Joe guy with an IRA and he was able to do this extraordinary investing. Now, I also know what you're thinking. He's a great investor. He's one of Warren Buffett's lieutenants. He ran his own fund. He knows what he's doing. And he started with $70,000 in 1989, which might not seem like that much money today here in 2021, but in 1989, that was a huge sum of money. Just for like some comparisons, um, a uh, law- lawyer at a large law firm, like one of the more most prestigious law firms, would have been being paid seventy thousand dollars a year in 1989. Like that would have been a top salary in 1989. So that is a big sum of money. Now, also just a reminder again: in 1984, the maximum was two thousand. It has gone up over time. So, but still. He started where everybody else can start and just started, uh, just started. That's kind of the key too, right? To start and um, start young as lesson number one points out. He started when he was 22. Now, remember my friend from the other podcast I've done recently who retired in 1990 and he had $50,000 payout package in his retirement. Now, remember, he was able to turn it into $5 million over the last 31 years. That was also by investing in stocks in like a retirement fund, a traditional IRA, not the Roth. Um, So he didn't really have any magic sauce there either. He followed some of Buffett's moves, as you recall. Um, He had a big winner over the 31 years because he retired from Sherwin-Williams and he got a chunk of that retirement in the stock of Sherwin-Williams, which has done well over the last 31 years, really well, actually. Uh, But he's had some losers in there like General Electric, and he's talked about that. Um, He also liked dividend stocks, and not to mention, he didn't own any tech. So he did not own the fangs, uh, and he was still able to grow it over the last 31 years from 50,000 to $5 million by buying good quality companies, staying invested through the downturns. He did talk about having cash on hand in the in his portfolio to buy when everybody was fleeing in, um, especially in 2008, 2009. That's when he bought some Bank of America stock when Warren Buffett bought the Bank of America stock when he, when he basically bailed them out. Um, and that's been a good investment for him too. So he's compounded the dividends in his style of investing in his portfolio into five million, and that's nothing to, to uh, you know, to put down either. Like uh, both investors are successful in being long-term investors and compounding basically an IRA into something that's quite amazing. So I imagine that Ted Wessler own tech and other growth names in order to get his portfolio from around the same time period all the way up there into over $264 million. You got to get a little more aggressive on uh, your portfolio to get that. But also notice his portfolio was at $131 million in 2012. He grew it to 264 by 218. So from January 3rd, 2012, so the very start of 2012, through now here when I'm recording this podcast, June 30th, 2021, the S&P 500 alone, not even individual stocks, just the S&P 500 is up 241% during that time period. So even if in 2012, when he converted it into a Roth, Mr. Wessler had decided, hey, I'm tired of having it in individual stocks. I'm just going to put it in the S&P 500 here. Even if he would have done that, he would have a portfolio worth $315 million today just from being in the S&P 500. I'm not, I didn't even look to see what it would be in the uh, NASDAQ, in the triple Q ETF, for instance. That has outperformed the S&P 500 by quite a bit, actually. So I don't know. It's probably worth at least 400 million at that in in just the QQQs. All of that is from compounding because he's starting at that high level and he's getting doubles, triple, if just in the S&P 500. 
And that is, again, the power of the compounding and how it works once you get up to these bigger amounts, even the 10,000, even the 100,000. And then my friend who has the $5 million, once he got to that 1 million, then you know it's off to the races. He told me that since the pandemic start and the rebound in the stock market, his portfolio had gained a million dollars over that time period because it was already at that higher level and we had extraordinary gain out of the pandemic lows. So the ultimate lesson, I think, from all of these, both of these stories is you can do this too. You can put money in into an IRA or a Roth IRA if you qualify by income to put it in there or your 401k at work and do what both of these guys have been able to do um, by following some of the lessons. But um, remember, it, it doesn't have to be the Roth IRA. It can just be any of these savings vehicles that allow you to uh, compound your money tax-free over long time periods. So what are the income qualifications for the, uh, for the Roth IRA? Uh, for single filers this year here in 2021, if you're listening to this in 2021, and it changes every year, so go check if you're listening to this any year later in 2022 or 2023. Uh, this year in 2021, it's up to 125,000. And that's adjusted, modify adjusted gross income. Uh, and the phase out is 125 to 140, where you can put some in, but you can't put the whole amount in. And if you're married and joint filing, you can make up to 198,000 in income. And the joint phase out is 198 to 208. So a little bit more narrow in the joint phase out to get the Roth IRA at all. The IRA is still available. And then of course, if your company or your job has a 401k, it's available there. And some of you may be lucky to have the Roth 401k and you might be able to use the Roth through that method. Uh, the limits this year, 2021, 6,000 a year if you're 49 and under. If you're 50 and above, they're giving you a little bit of bonus to try to catch up. And so that's 7,000 for here in 2021 if you're 50 and above. And nobody says you have to put all 6,000 into it. If this is just a side account, if you're already funding a 401k um, or you know something else on the side, you, you can do whatever you want. You could put a thousand bucks in it. You could put half in, you, you know, it's that nothing is set in stone, but the point is to put something and allow time to uh, be on your side. So even putting this money into the indexes over long periods of decades uh, historically has grown it. So 10% returns a year will double your money in seven years. So that's not too shabby. And right now, I know a lot of you are thinking, eh, 10%, that's easy. I, I've been doing that the last couple of years. No problem, I do that in a month in some of my stocks, right? Uh, right now, we are in this very bullish period, and yes, that might be happening for some of you. But over the long haul, 10% is pretty good. Uh, that's that's gonna again double your money every seven years and you'll be doing pretty good if you can do the 10% there but the key again is to start when Ted was 22 putting money into an IRA was likely a drag I mean that's that's pretty young to be starting on your retirement right and um, maxing out when you're only making 22,000 if you're putting two two thousand in that's a lot of his income to be putting in. He was lucky he managed to swing it all those years. But five years later, when he had 70,000 there, he was seeing the power of compounding. So he got lucky and was smart enough to fund it early and now has been reaping the benefits. And frankly, um, you know, he's still young enough where he will continue to reap those benefits 
over many more years. The Roth IRA does not have a minimum distribution. So at least not right now as of 2021. So um, there's that. But I know another question you're going to be asking is what stocks? We don't know what Ted put it in. We do know what my friend Ed put his in. And I mentioned some of those things like Sherwin-Williams. There's no guarantee. And my friend Ed keeps a pretty tight portfolio between 10 and 20 stocks, I think is what he said. And so you can keep track of all of that um, pretty easily. And you can be somewhat diverse in 10 to 20 stocks. So I do recommend being diverse, know your companies, know your comfort level and what you kind of risk level you can take. My friend Ed, again, was buying a lot of those dividend stocks because he liked getting that cash into his account and then buying other stocks with it. Um, so he used the dividend payers, which he knew weren't going to be huge uh, gainers in the stock market, to buy other things. And that has worked well for him. So have your own plan and your own strategy. Um, again, FANG is still out there, still growing, is still fairly attractively priced. Several of the FANG stocks as growth stocks, not necessarily value, but I've talked about in the past whether or not fangs have been cheap, and some of them have been, even in the last year, they had the big gains off of the coronavirus lows, but some of them have been stagnant and just kind of hanging out over the last like nine months or so, and that has brought valuations down a bit. So some of the fangs I still like, the banks are still cheap here, including uh, Bank of America, BAC is the ticker, JP Morgan, the other kind of leader of the big banks, JPM. Some of the banks, uh, big banks and regionals have been raising their dividends now because they've been given the green light by the Federal Reserve. They passed those stress tests, so they're looking good with their balance sheets again. They're buying back shares, so they are shareholder friendly. Uh, another regional bank that I've talked about that I like a lot is West Banco, ticker WSBC, headquartered in West Virginia. Uh, but there's other regionals I've talked about that I like a lot as well. So um, a lot going on in the banking area. Um, another area is in the payment systems. And I know what you're thinking, like PayPal, Square, uh, Stoneco out of Brazil, those are all well known of the payment system type companies. But one that might not be as well known that I own in the value investor portfolio here at Zacks is Fisserv, F-I-S-E-R-V is the name, F-I-S-V is the ticker, V is in Victor, F is in Frank. So F is in Frank, I, S is in Sam, V is in Victor, they are a payment systems company. They do customer and channel management, all the same thing, services for uh, banks and companies that need it. They have a segment called Clover, which is their cloud-based point of sale solution. So they're in the same game as PayPal and Square. They just don't get the publicity. They're a lot cheaper than those two. PE of just 19.6, so still a little pricey to call it value technically, but it has a peg ratio of 1.24, which is pretty low, almost at the value level. Year to date, these shares are actually down 6.3%, does not pay a dividend, but shares are down 6.3 after a number of years of nice growth, so it's kind of taking a time out here. So that could be one to take a look at if you're looking for a little bit more value, but you want to get into the payment system somehow because this is a hot area and it's in fintech essentially. And this is a cheaper way to get into fintech. And another on the tech side that I still love, I also own in the value investor is Sony ticker S-O-N-Y. They changed their ticker, so it's now S-O-N-Y, but Sony in so many different areas in entertainment, uh, also in cameras, every almost every phone uses a Sony camera in their phone now. And so they've been killing it on several different segments. Their entertainment side has been down, but the gaming has been crushing it. Shares are still cheap here. 
because they're down 4% year to date. They haven't really had the recovery a lot of the other techie names have recently had here in 2021. And it still sports a nice PE of just 17.2, does pay a dividend, but it's low. It's like 0.5% right now. Um, so dividend is not really the big thing with Sony. I think they were doing a share buyback, but don't quote me on that. I can't remember now if they decided to do one. They might, but outlook is good. Management is fairly conservative and they guide conservatively. And so they tend to come out with these real nice uh, quarters. The semiconductor supply chain issue is going to be impacting them here, but that's just a short term thing. So I would be a buyer of Sony on any further weakness. But companies like this are nice to own in some long term portfolios. My value investor has owned Sony since I want to say 2018 now, 2018. And so we've been in it a number of years and um, that our patience in holding it has paid off so far. But again, past performance isn't necessarily an indicator of the future. That's always the problem, right? I wish we all had the crystal ball that would tell us who the big winners are going to be because that would make it easier. But I hope this podcast kind of shows you that over longer periods of time, not just one year, not just five years, not even just 10 years, but much longer, 20, 30, 40 years is when you really see the benefit of stock investing because of compounding. And wealth can be uh, grown, can be created, even through these smaller accounts that we're funding when we're younger and we have the ability to use time to our advantage. And for those of you who are older, remember my friend Ed started his account in 1990 at age 60. He is now 91. So it's never too late is what I like to say um, because you could get the compounding even if you start later in life. But hopefully many of you are younger and you can follow Ted's example, the lesson, the number one lesson, start when you're young, use the power of compounding but stay in the game, he stayed in all those years, which isn't easy to do when we're getting bear markets, but he did. And now it's paying off in this bull market environment and um, it's just gonna keep compounding from there. So I wanna be like Ted and I wanna have a Roth IRA like that too. So it is possible, and um, but you gotta start. Got to, you got to start somewhere, even if it's small. Okay, let me recap some of the tickers I talked about. I did talk about PayPal um, because Peter Thiel compounded his into $5 billion, but he had that advantage of the founder shares. But PayPal has been a great performer since it was spun off from eBay, no doubt about it. Huge winner for anyone who's owned PayPal and held on that entire time. So congrats on that for Peter Thiel and everyone else who held on, but PayPal, PYPL. Then we talked about some of the banks, Bank of America, BAC. Um, my friend Ed is in that one, and uh, I still like it here. Then he's also in Sherwin-Williams. That's had a huge run-up, and it's not nearly as cheap anymore as it used to be. I love the company, but I've been on the sidelines for a couple of years because I just couldn't stand the valuation. But it's a big beneficiary of the reopening here. SHW is the ticker. Then on the bank side again, JP Morgan, we all know that one. They're about to report here. Uh, Another quarterly earnings report, JPM is the ticker. West Banco is the regional West Virginia bank I like a lot. WSBC is the ticker. If you want something cheaper than PayPal, but still is in the payment system side of things, FISERV, F as in Frank, I, S as in Sam, V as in Victor, F, I, S, V. And then wrapping it up with a cheap tech company, um, also on entertainment and content side, Sony, ticker S, O, N, Y. And as always, you want to be sure to subscribe so you get all the Value Investor podcasts because you never know what's going to be going on in the world of value and when we can talk about someone creating a Roth IRA worth $264 million. 
off of just simply investing in stocks. There's always something good going on. Get us at Apple Podcasts, get us on Spotify, get us on Amazon Music or wherever you can. And I'll see you again next time with some more value stocks. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.